Thank you very much for that warm welcome. I appreciate it. It's kind of interesting in the uh, last week as I was getting ready for this, uh, three things happened that impacted how I wrote this talk. Now, last Monday, Margaret Thatcher died. On Wednesday, my uh, best friend, a man who's also in his late 60s, I know I don't look like I'm in my late 60s. You don't have to say anything about that, but thank you, uh, told me he was going to have his first grandchild. And finally, Sunday the 14th marked the 10th anniversary of the uh, completion of the Human Genome Project, the mapping project. And on Monday, just two days ago, the US Supreme Court heard a case that may impact the whole future of biotechnology. Now, for reasons that I'll explain as I go along, these disparate events may be related. So I want to thank the gods of speechwriters for what that great comic W.C. Fields used to call a most fortuitous circumstance. Now let me start off talking a little bit about my friend's grandchild. The child is due in December, and that's two months uh, after we begin enrolling something like 20 million people who are supposed to start in the uh, Obamacare insurance exchanges. Now I know my friend is concerned about what kind of world the child will be born into. The cost of American health care will be somewhere north of $2.8 trillion this year. And that represents at least 18% of our gross domestic product. But this speech is not about gloom and doom. Now, I know you've heard this before. Healthcare is like a three-leg stool. One leg is about access, another is about cost, and the third is about quality. And the theory goes that you might get two of these three legs, but you won't necessarily get all three. Now, if the exchanges are fully implemented, and that's a big if, by the way, but if they are implemented, we should see access improved, cost increases may or may not be slowed, but, and we heard a little bit about this in the last panel, there's much concern about what happens to the quality of care in the new environment that's coming. And I know that quality has been a major concern at this meeting and for your organization even long before that. So, like in the last group just before me, I can tell you that a major topic of discussion where I come from and what I've seen elsewhere in the country is what will happen to quality when millions of people who now have uh, no access to health care or may be getting it for the first time or haven't had it for a long time um, come up against a stark reality that we're facing a shortage of primary care physicians, nurses, and general surgeons. Now, Massachusetts faced this problem of too many patients and too few doctors with the advent of what I'll call Romney care. I'm still fighting the last campaign. But the issue vanished after a few years. Now, some say that Massachusetts is not a good example for this because more than 90% of the people in that state had health insurance to begin with, unlike places like Texas and Arizona and New Mexico and California, uh, where a quarter or more of their people are not insured. But here's the thing, and I don't know if you've heard these numbers before. Frankly, I find them very astounding. We need 45,000 more primary care physicians, over a million more nurses, and 40,000 more surgeons before my friend's grandchild turned seven in 2020. This has engendered a topic for national discussion about the role of the nurse practitioner. Now, the two states represented here are in the forefront. You allow a lot of freedom 
uh, and responsibility and accountability to your nurse practitioners, but that's not quite the case in most other states. How much autonomy to grant her, and it's usually a her about 95% of the time, how much supervision must she receive from a licensed physician, especially in a rural practice where her only link to the outside may just be telemedicine? Can she have full prescribing prescri privileges, which many states currently don't allow? Now, this also came up in the last group. There's growing interest in the role of the ACO, the Accountable Care Organization. Will they really free up physicians to practice real medicine while augmenting their efforts by other trained professionals, or will it be merely rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? Now, I can tell you I went to a well-run ACO practice about two weeks ago myself, and they proudly had a poster explaining the concept of what they were all about in their office. And I realized it was actually a marketing tool for them and a practice builder, although they were pretty busy, but it was a practice builder. Now, one other thing that may also affect quality, it may, I see it as usually a good thing, depending on how it plays out, and that's the new immigration bill. We've yet to see this thing. We've yet to see the new immigration bill. It may be introduced this week. They may be introducing it now, even as I speak with you. It's supposed to have provisions to allow in people with skills, perhaps qualified medical uh, doctors who want to practice here once they're properly credentialed by us. We'll see. It won't be the first time that we've done this, not the first time that we've opened our doors to medical help from overseas. Shortly after World War II, we had a serious shortage of specialists in this country. And we helped to close that gap through our immigration policies. Also, GIs getting their GI benefits. Many of them were primary care physicians. They started to go to, back to med school and they specialized. Um, it was very common when I was a kid to hear about the brain drain. As other countries complained about our aggressive recruitment of their physicians, they're mathematicians, they're scientists, they're engineers, and so on. So there is history, there is precedent for this. Um, and it sounds like they will be putting a focus on skills. Let's keep our fingers crossed, because I think this will help. But we'll see what comes out of Washington. Maybe we can even get back some of the foreign students who trained here as undergraduates or graduate students who also speak English. That's before we gave them 60 days to pack their bags and get out. A total waste of um, great assets for us. And maybe we can attract some of them back and maybe they'll want to go to med school. Uh, we'll see um, what happens with that. But as I mentioned, this is um, not a talk about gloom and doom. And speaking of the physician shortage and very busy doctors, because now it's, you know, if a doctor can spend five or 10 minutes with you, that's really a lot. Uh, but there's a great story that captures all of this. And it's a story told by the great Broadway comic, Jackie Mason. Now, the way he tells this, there were three guys talking. And one of them says, you know, my doctors, really big. He says, my doctor's so big, you can't get to see him for three months. His friend says, really? He says, my doctor's bigger than that. My doctor's so big, you can't get to see him for six months. Third guy steps in and says, well, I must have the biggest guy of all. No one's ever seen him. <laughs> well, that may be where we're heading. Now, I'm an economist by training, and I want to discuss health care costs. We now spend $8,000 per person per year on all forms of health care. That's the highest in the world. And as I've mentioned before, it's 18% of our GDP. Belgium, France, and Switzerland come in next with about 10 to 12% of their GDP spent on health care, but their per capita spending is only about half of ours, and their life expectancy is greater. And as you may have heard, we rank only 35th in the world for life expectancy. We're just kind of expensive, and there's a question of what we're getting for it. And it's growing. 
men is it growing? According to the Congressional Budget Office forecast, at the rate at which our costs are growing for health care, when my friend's grandchild reaches 17 years of age in 2030, health care will account for 29% of our GDP. By mid-century, when the grandchild will be 37 years old, 48% of our GDP, 48% will be consumed by health care. And now here's the stunner, it's in the CBO forecast. When the, quote, child will be just slightly older than I am now, when he'll be or she'll be 69 in 2082, are you ready for this? <laughs> Healthcare is expected to be 99% of our GDP. Now there are other forecasts that are less than that, but um, that one, since it comes from a supposedly unbiased source, I thought I would use that. And don't blame Medicare and Medicaid. Um, they'll only account, it's estimated, for about a third, a little less than a third um, of that spend. The rest of it's coming from all kinds of other sources. But even right now, healthcare sucks the air out of everything. Based on surveys that my group has done in the past, and we've done them consistently from about the year 2000, um, people think they're spending about 9% of their pre-tax income on health care. Um, and they will demand, they tell us, to be placed into single-payer health care, or at least have that option, um, when that reaches 18% of their pre-tax income. Uh, at that point, they're cutting way back on everything. I've said in some other speeches in the past, the greatest threat to the American box office is actually health care, because that's the first thing that's going. Netflix, not so bad. But the first threat to the American movie industry at the box office, if these trends continue, is going to be health care. So they'll cut back on that. They'll cut back on travel. They'll cut back on vacation. They'll cut back on food. Savings will be virtually impossible. Uh, and buying a car, forget it. Uh, so we've got a problem here. Now, although it's called the Affordable Care Act, uh, Obamacare is mostly about access to health care, but it may be a boon to cash-strapped hospitals, which have been cost-shifting to the rest of us for years to make up for lost funds due to providing care for the uninsured and the underinsured. It's difficult to know just how much Obamacare will actually save us, as so many states have opted out of the insurance exchanges and the expansion of Medicaid, they've opted out of that as well, something like 30 states, rather than opting in. Now looking back at the history of these things in the past, I personally think all the states will eventually come around. My evidence for this is that the original implementation of Medicaid, um, in that first year, only five or six states signed on. 20 more signed on after the first year, and then the rest eventually followed in some fashion. It was simply too expensive for them not to. So there's a lot of uh, moaning and groaning and yelling and screaming, but I think they will come around if the past is prelude. But just the Medicare provisions of the law are estimated to save $428 billion between 2010 and 2019. It is something, it's not nothing. But even under Obamacare, the rosiest forecast that I've seen is that health care costs will still be 40% or more of our GDP by 2080. It's still totally unsustainable. I want to put this health care cost issue in another perspective. You have to understand that our way of paying for health care is totally accidental. It's a totally accidental system that arose from a compromise reached during World War II between organized labor, corporations, and the federal government uh, who were dealing with the issue of wage and price controls. And in fact, the best book I ever read on this subject was called The Accidental System, Healthcare Policy in the United States by Professor Michael D. Reagan of the University of California at Riverside. Uh, a gentleman I, int I interviewed on my radio show, in fact. 
he pointed out that employer-paid health care was the compromise carved out back then, and that that sent us down the yellow brick road that we've been mostly following ever since, that no other country went down that road. Did you know, for example, to zero in on a particular industry, that health care is the second largest cost in manufacturing a car? Salaries, wages, and then health care. Lee Iacocca pointed this out years ago in his autobiography. He said, we actually produce more American cars in Canada than we do in Michigan. And then later I heard that's even with the auto bailout. These are American cars made by UAW workers. Why? Because Canada has health care and, uh, and the cars can be shipped here with no tariff thanks to the NAFTA treaty, which we also signed. The Japanese car makers were so successful here because they did not have the legacy health care costs of Chrysler, Ford, and GM. A growing number of employers have for many years not offered health insurance anyway to their workers. And did you happen to see the article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago? In a national study of large and medium-sized companies, the average health care cost per employee is now over $11,000 per year, not counting what the employees pay out of pocket. Uh, and uh, more and more of the tab, obviously, is being shifted over to the employees. Furthermore, there's a growing number of programs to penalize employees for being overweight or for smoking, for example. But at these health care cost levels, what will our employment picture look like for my friend's grandchild when that time comes? And will our health care system have eaten our economy? Um, I've said this in many speeches in the past, in broadcasts and so on. I am concerned that the system will eat the economy that the federal government isn't going away on the overall subject of health care. Starting with the health care insurance compromise I just talked about at the outset of World War II, Harry Truman tried but failed to bring about national health care just a few years later in 1948. The Hill-Burton Act, which expanded uh, hospitals, uh, passed in 1954. President Johnson uh, got Medicare and Medicaid passed in 1965. Even Richard Nixon toyed with the idea of national health care, but it went nowhere. Bob Dole and 20 other senators gave up on catastrophic health care coverage in 1992 uh, because seniors hated the idea. And of course, Hillary Clinton tried but failed to get her plan through in the mid-90s. And instead, we got a huge uptick in private managed care and that lovely sobriquet, mangled care, came out of it. In 2010, the Affordable Care Act passed. If Obamacare should fail in its implementation and or do little or nothing to reduce costs, the Washington Post reports that other groups have already been formed to tackle costs, such as a group called the Partnership for Sustainable Health Care. It's a new alliance which includes health plans, a large hospital group, and consumer advocates. Washington obviously has no shortage of think tanks. The next legislation is inevitable. And perhaps the devil you know, even with its uncertainties, is better than the devil you don't know. And if you think Obamacare will raise costs rather than lower them, Maybe Jay Leno said it best. He says, let's just pretend it's another unnecessary war and you'll feel better about it already. In the UK, only about 10% of the people have private health insurance and the rest are covered by the uh, national health care system. Those who have private health insurance are very wealthy and or leading executives with major corporations who want to pay for their, I call them Cadillac plans, but they could be Rolls Royce or Bentley plans. And they're often resented by the general population who are in the NHS. As Mrs. Thatcher described in her autobiography, the last time she ran for office while she was prime minister, she was attacked by the opposition because they had learned that she had private health insurance and the implication was that she was not one of the people. After some research, however, it was learned that her opponents and uh, 
Chief critics all had private health insurance. The whole mess was one of utter hypocrisy. But my fear is, as the years roll on, we'll just simply be in two groups, uh, with about 10%, uh, as in the UK, having access to these Cadillac plans. American health insurers must suspect that Obamacare may actually be their lifeline. Otherwise, um, as my friend's forthcoming grandchild and his or her children reach the end of this century, private health insurance, frankly, will be a long ago thing of the past. The good news, however, is that 10% of the US population could still be 40 or 50 million people by then. Um, there will probably be uh, fewer than the current 1,200 insurance companies that we have today, but maybe they'll be satisfied with fighting over just that segment. And on Monday, two days ago, the U.S. Supreme Court heard a case that may impact on the future of biotechnology. In the future world of my friend's grandchild, his or her physician could have their complete genome in their computer. Total sequencing costs should easily be down to maybe $1,000 or less. Somewhere during uh, this decade um, versus, believe it or not, uh, it was $100 million at one point to have all your genes sequenced 10 years ago. President Obama recently said that every dollar spent on the Human Genome Project has already returned 140 to our economy. Right now, something like 5,000 diseases are linked to genes. Sometimes it's just one gene, and other times it may be a series of genes. Only about 20,000 genes really matter, but 20% of them have been patented. Knowing you may be at risk for something, however, doesn't mean that you can do anything about it. And we've known for 50 years, for example, what causes sickle cell disease, but there's not much you can do about it. Now, there's one other point I wanted to make about um, this whole issue of biotech and what happens to your test results and so on. And it's something we need to think about. Based on a law that the president signed a year or two ago, you can't be denied health insurance because of your uh, DNA findings. But you can still be excluded from disability insurance. You can still be dis disallowed uh, life insurance and long-term care insurance. So yeah, we made a major step towards protecting people, but there are these other elements that we now have to zero in on and, um, and get people protected. Now, whenever I give this speech about the future of healthcare, I'm aware that everything I say can change in a flash. Somewhere out there may be a scientist or a team of scientists on the verge of discovering some great breakthrough that unlocks it all, that saves costs and uh, enhances the quality of care and can be accessed by everyone. And maybe it'll come later and maybe my friend's grandchild will be the one who discovers it. But there's one thing that seems to be true, and I've told a couple of stories about this all, already. Uh, Mark Twain may have said it best when he said, you know, and this, our future may hang on this, the greatest inventor of all is accident.